that in fact, if you think of it like in those philosophical terms as a sort of proof by the negative route, that in fact the failure of the imperialist adventure in Iraq is proving, proving the necessity of a tendency towards something like empire, like we're saying. The fact that even the US, the military superpower, uh, cannot do this today, it could sustain the argument that in fact it's not no longer possible. And that something like what we're calling empire is really necessary. I mean necessary, not like we want it. Necessary in order to keep the rich rich and the poor poor. In order to maintain stable power structures. In order to allow for the profits of global capital. That's what I mean necessary. And that's the kind of thing we're looking at. In, if you're, in certain, whatever, um, poor terms, what we're asking in this part of the project is, what form of power are we facing today? Or what form of power will we face tomorrow? Because it matters to us. It implies different kinds of resistance. If it's really US imperialism, it implies one thing. But if it's going to be something else, we better be ready for it. It's a different kind of resistance. It's, it provides different kinds of possibilities and also different kinds of tactics. That's why this matters. I mean, otherwise it's just, I mean, I, I seem to be less and less interested in, in these the strictly academic questions. I want to know what it means for political practice. And that's why, and that's why I care, whether it's one or the other. And I might be wrong, too. Don't get me wrong. I might be wrong that this is uh, necessary. It might be, but I'm stubbornly convinced. There you go. Um, I want to do one more, one more thing about how bad things are before I try to get to. Because I think, you know, it's, that's another thing. If this really were US imperialism, in some ways it'd be easier. We know who the enemy is. We know how to attack. We've faced imperialism before. We've had national liberation struggles. It's nothing new. If, in fact, this is a new kind of power that, in fact, doesn't have the same kind of center, you know, if, if only there were still a winter palace you could, you, could, you, could, you, know, you could invade. If only power were really centered like that, it would be easier. I would love it. But the, if, if, in fact, we're right that it's decentered, in fact, you, know, you might think, this is another way of thinking about the project if you're oriented this way, we're, we're trying to make sense out of some mysterious things Foucault said about power not having a center. We're in fact trying to read Foucault as having a sort of a premonition of the direction in which uh, these power structures were going. Maybe there was no Winter Palace back then in 1917, but clearly today, this is what we're arguing, there is no Winter Palace to invade. The White House is really not the center of global power, despite their own deliriums. Anyway, the one last thing I want to say about how bad things are is about war. Because I think that war... Um, and the relationship between war and politics has changed, or is in, in the process of changing, it might be at least the emblem of one of the greatest obstacles to democracy today. Um, and it, the condition of it, and then I'll try to give four um, ways of analysis, uh, analyzing it. The condition of it, it seems to me, is that war has today expanded both spatially and temporally. Um, to the point of becoming uh, either global and permanent, or at least uh, spatially unlimited and temporally indeterminate. I mean it kind of this way, that, um, you know, of course there are uh, numerous individual wars around the world. I mean, there's long-lasting war in, in Sierra Leone, in, in, in Aceh and in Indonesia, in Colombia, obviously, Iraq, Israel, Palestine. Uh, India, Pakistan, and each war, each war, of course, has its own peculiarities. It has its own economy. It's based on diamonds or gold or oil or something like that, and it has its own history, its own cultural history. But I think that one can never, one can't understand any of these wars in isolation. Um, in fact, if you try to study them, you can't understand their, even their rationality without linking them to these other states of war. And in fact than to a kind of global system of warfare in which they, in which they are a part. So of course they're all different in particular, but it seems to me that they're best understood as a kind of constellation of wars. I mean, that's one starting approach to the, what seems to me like a global state of war. But it's more than that, it's, it's rather that um, we've entered an age in which it seems to me there's the generalized or even universal recognition that um, that peace is unimaginable, that we are constantly threatened by uh, lethal violence. And one way you could think of, of September 11 as the recognition that finally the US, probably the last place in the world to recognize this, recognized that it too is vulnerable 
constantly to the threat of lethal violence. I mean, there are a lot of parts of the world that, that that's no big surprise. There's been a constant state of war since, since you know, colonialism was a state of war, slavery was a state of war, and there's been a continuing in the post-colonial uh, post state of war. But nonetheless, I think that there's something different today about that recognition of the uh, inescapability of this state of war, that inability to guarantee peace. That might be another way of saying it. So that's what I'm partly thinking about the spatial expansion of it. The temporal expansion of it, it's much simpler. I mean, Rumsfeld's happy to tell you every day that uh, the way he puts it, we're only at the beginning of this war on terror. Don't expect it to end. Or, or Bush, this is my favorite one, that during the last election in that like brief window of lucidity, Bush says something like, when asked, when are we going to win the war on terror, he says, no, of course we're not going to win it. You know, that this isn't the kind of war you win. And then the next day, of course, they said, no, 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 we're about to win it, it's almost won, blah, blah. But it's true <laughs> that, it's true that the way this is conceived, this, you know, U.S. war on terror, but I would also argue the state of war more generally, is as something not permanent, but completely open-ended temporally. You know, something that is, if not a permanent condition, is not conceived as a per permanent condition, at least as something that, that uh, for which we don't see an end. This is the, what had, occurred to Tony and I a while ago as a way of explaining this, is it much less like war, it's much more like police activity. I mean, you can see this if you try just in the terms of international law, the U.S. is always declaring these police actions, not wars. But it's more, more than that, it's like, uh, like police activity you never win. Like the cops, you know, the cops have a great victory one day, they go out and have beers, they got to go to work the next day. You don't win police actions. The police is a constant activity, and that's what we're something like. Rather than wars, which traditionally have beginnings and ends, you have a truce, etc. So it's this way that I'm thinking, um, and I don't mean to be terribly apocalyptic about this, but, but it doesn't look good. Um, I mean, I, I find that I, uh, the reaction I get often is, oh, Mike, you're just being so apocalyptic, it's not really that bad. Well, it's true, but what I'm trying to pose is actually the generalized nature and systemic nature of this problem rather than its reliance on specific individuals and, and accidents. I mean, I don't think it's Bush's, I don't think it's a personal attribute of Bush that, that we are experiencing the state of war, or of some other actor. Rather, I'm trying to understand it as something that's uh, systemic and, um, and structural. So here are my four consequences of ways of recognizing what it would mean, like what are the effects of this spatial and temporal expansion of the state of war. Um, the first one, just in, um, as a sort of uh, homage for Giorgio Agamben, who's you know, a great um, presence here, is thinking about it as in terms of the state of exception. And here, just let me do this. So this is a constitutional law perspective. And the point is this, that the, um, the rationality of the juridical concept of the state of exception is based on its temporary nature. And this is from ancient Roman law, that um, there will be a uh, suspension of the Constitution in order to save the Constitution. And that paradoxical formulation only makes sense because it's temporary. Like, we're going to suspend habeas corpus because we need to defend the nation against the attack. In two years, when the war is over, it'll be restored. The thing is, when the war appears permanent, or at least long-lasting, the constitutional concept completely changes. The suspension of democracy, or the suspension of rights, or the suspension of aspects of the Constitution, in no longer being temporary, become not a way to save the Constitution, but a way to destroy the Constitution. I guess all I want to point to is the fact that when, and this, Giorgio says this much more elegantly than I, um, that when the state of exception has a different temporality, it completely changes complexion. This is it's still in the, in the rubric of just because I thought it was a way of tying all these things together, is thinking about this as an obstacle to democracy. I mean, then, you know, think of the Patriot Act, um, the U.S. transformation of international law, Guantanamo, etc. All of these are, are, in a way, constitutional logics that are, that they have, are under the tradition of the state of exception, but like I say, since no longer temporary, have a very different view than previously used. The second approach, and it's an approach to the same concept, what's the consequences of this spatial and temporal uh, expansion of, of, of war, is a kind of inversion of, or one way others have approached it as an inversion of the relation between politics and, and warfare. 